This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 138 of the Dressage Radio Show, brought to you with the generous support of Equestrian Collections. Hello and welcome to the show, coming to you from a very crispy Kentucky this week. I'm going to be joined by Catherine Haddad, who's going to co-host the show with me this week, and we are going to address the sometimes controversial but always interesting topic of dressage judging. And we're going to be joined also by Inga Wolfram from the Netherlands in just a second. But first of all, a word about our sponsors. Equestrian Collections has a New Year closeout sale of ladies' ERS equestrian shirts with popular brand names such as Ovation and Romp of dressage tees to long sleeve shirts and polos for showing, schooling or casual wear. Enjoy the great savings on these shirts while the sale lasts by visiting the website at equestriancollections.com. And if you use coupon code HRN at the checkout, you'll get $10 off your next order of $100 or more. Equestrian Collections is a participating retailer of the Horse World Gives Back campaign. Well, hi, Catherine. Hi, Chris. It's nice to talk to you. How are you? I'm excellent, and I'm, I'm very happy to be moving into 2012, and the new year has started out rather well for me, and I hope it's the same for you. Yes, it's getting there slowly but surely. It's getting a little bit nippy here in Kentucky. And remind everybody where exactly you are in Germany. I'm in Fechte, which is in the north, and we are having a very mild winter as far as temperatures go, which I'm very happy about, except that it's raining all the time. It rained all the way through Christmas, all the way through New Year's. Really dark, wet, nasty weather. Well, that's not very uh, wintry. I mean, that's not very sporting, is it? Do you get to go skiing at all? No, normally not. I mean, I I love to ski and I go every, oh, I don't know, five or six years I get a chance to go. Um, But not in this region. It's flat anyway. And you have to go to the south of Germany for that. Right. Well, what else do you do for fun? I mean, I'm I'm sure you had a wonderful Christmas. Now, now as a newly married woman, you, you experienced it as a married woman for the first time. Yes. Unfortunately, my husband and I did not get to spend Christmas together. Oh, no. <laughs> he was on call at his clinic, and he had just spent um, almost two weeks with me here in, in Germany just before Christmas. And then he went home in order to take call at the clinic over Christmas. So we couldn't spend Christmas together. Um, but I had the wonderful opportunity once again to spend Christmas with my staff. And I have a, a really great team right now of dedicated, skilled, talented riders who also happen to be funny and entertaining and we had a really nice Christmas Eve at home, cooked a four-course meal, and put up a Christmas tree. That Actually, we did that a few nights before. Drank a little bit. It was very, very merry, so I had a lovely Christmas. Very, very merry. And- That's how it's supposed to be. Now, you mentioned the four-course meal. Y- you do have a reputation for being quite good in the kitchen. Yeah, I give it my best shot. You, 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 en- to- you enjoy it, don't you? I really enjoy it. As much as I enjoy riding, I enjoy, enjoy cooking and eating which is why I keep riding so that I don't get fatter. <laughs> That's um, a good plan. <laughs> yeah, we had, we had a really lovely meal. Now, do you get really into the, sort of the German cuisine or is it European? European. Yeah. And I, I've had a, a lot of influence from Australia because I spent quite a bit of time in Australia and uh, France. There's a huge influence and Italian, uh, Italy. So Australia, Italy and France and, of course, my Lebanese background. So a, a heavy Mediterranean uh, Stint also. Well, tell us about the Australian background then and the cuisine, because, you know, we have a lot of listeners down under and they'll want to know where, first of all, where were you based down there and what uh, culinary delights did you take home to cook? Well, I was in my early 20s when I went to Australia. Oh, God, a long time ago then. A long time ago, and I still remember (laughs) some of it. (laughs) And uh, I was based in Sydney for most of it. And I have to say my biggest influence from the Australian kitchen was was basically the use of incredibly fresh ingredients, uh, meaning fresh fruits, fruits from the tree, fresh fruits from the sea, um, fresh lamb from the, the pasture, and being able to take a lot of local things and combine them um, 
without adding a lot of heavy sauces like the French do. And um, I, I just, I felt like my, my senses opened up in Australia and I was able to taste a lot of different things and combine wines with them. And it was, it was a very influential time for me in my, my cooking history. So it doesn't, wasn't just about the Barbie then? In, um... No, no, absolutely <laughs> not. And the Australians really know how to cook lamb. Oh, yes. Lamb and seafood. So I learned a lot there. Wonderful. Well, that makes my mouth water, Catherine. And, uh, you know, I know uh, we've, we've got a big program this week, uh, you know, kicking off uh, the new year. And uh, we, we should tell everybody that Inga Wolfram is going to join us in just a minute here because uh, you know Inga. You met her, didn't you? At the Yes. T- tell us what you knew about uh, Inga then because this was an idea of Wayne Shannon's for, to bring her on the show. Yes. Well, well, I had actually met Inga over the phone several years ago when she was researching a project uh, at the university. And uh, it was actually a survey, not a survey, but a study that she was doing. And she was asking me how I prepare myself for horse shows, how I create better focus, um, what my methods are for getting myself into the show ring and being really fully concentrated. We had a long conversation about that, and that was three or four years ago. And then since then, she's become very active um, in the area of dressage judging and studying how judges perceive things in the test, uh, how they might be influenced by things outside the test. And she's been quite outspoken and basically unafraid to present her findings at the Global Dressage Forum, which she's done now two years in a row. And as riders, many of us have been really relieved to have... um, She's an outsider in that she's not a top rider in the world. She, she's a lower level rider, but she's really made it her profession now to study dressage judging. And she has helped the riders uh, gain a voice in, in the subject of, of dressage judging and making changes within it. And we have, since she became involved with the, the study of dressage ju- judging, we've actually seen an amazing increase in openness, transparency, and um, we've seen a lot of judges respond very, very positively to what she's had to say. So we've had some really positive changes in the last two years. Well, let's get Inger on the line. Um, Inger, you're joining us from the Netherlands. Tell us exactly where you are. Uh, I live uh, near Utrecht. That is pretty much in the middle of the Netherlands. So really, if, if you like, it's the heart of horsey country as well. Well, as I said, you're well qualified to talk about the very topics that we're going to address. And there are so many, of course, involved with judging. And we're going to start to tackle some of those. But just give us a sense of your background, if you would, Inga, so our listeners can appreciate exactly where you're coming from on this subject. Okay, um, my background is is relatively varied. Um, I have uh, competed myself, but in a slightly different discipline in vaulting uh, in my youth. I I now also ride dressage, but just at the basic grassroots level. Um, I recently completed my PhD on uh, sports psychology uh, in equestrian sports, really. Um, I also hold a, a master's in human and equine sports, and then specialized also as a practicing sports psychologist. Um, My practical application is very much involved with working with riders on various psychological issues, but that also includes the judges, and that's really something that I've been involved with quite a lot for the past two years and have now started uh, a few research projects investigating how judges react, uh, what they look at, um, and, and those kind of kind of issues, really. Well, Catherine, you know, we've talked about it on the show before, haven't we? Not least of all when Wayne Shannon was on recently, because there are so many dimensions to this. And as a competitor, you have a different perspective to to you know someone like Inga or myself. So, give us some thoughts on how we you know how we should view this whole topic, because there are so many aspects to it. But from a rider's perspective. I think from a rider's perspective, it's very important, first of all, to view the topic, uh, the subject openly and not be afraid to discuss it. Um, there are obviously some differ- differential, differing, um, different opinions between riders. Some think that complaining, quote unquote, about the judging is, is not a good idea. And I would agree that com- just complaining about something is never really productive. But I think that uh, we have a very modern sport, a sport that's modernizing itself. It's highly commercial. 
There's a lot of professionalism in our sport, and it's time that the judging catches up with that. And I don't mean that as a complaint or, or a, a negative statement. Uh, I just feel like we could also modernize our judging program, the way we are actually judged in the arena. And I think it could become fairer and more transparent um, and therefore make the sport more interesting for everyone involved from the very lowest level to the highest level. Well, you mentioned those levels, Catherine, which is what I was going to take, where I was going to take us next, because whilst you're a Grand Prix rider, the majority of our listeners are riding at the lower levels. However, to get to where you are now, you had to go up through the levels. So you have a perspective of all those different levels and what it takes to compete. Uh, yes, and, I do. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's start to look at, um, first of all, judging accuracy and fairness. Inga, let me bring you in here because I think that's the one thing that riders are going to say, well, was that accurate? Was that fair? You know, was I treated fairly? At the same time, considering Catherine's point there about us not, riders not whining about their scores, but let's be constructive about it. What are we taking away? Well, couldn't agree more really uh, certainly uh, with with Catherine's view in the sense that I think we need to be solution focused uh, that's the only way of doing things but I also sort of understand a little bit some of the writers that might say oh, oh is uh, lots of complaining going to lead us uh, into trouble um, for the simple reason that judges are humans and and this is really one of the points I've been making uh, at the Global Dressage Forum in 2010 and, and that was repeated again this year in, in 2011, namely that judges are human and that they might actually remember um, all the troubles that some riders might, might have caused. And I'm not saying that they'd deliberately take that into account. And, and, and please don't, don't get me wrong when I say this now, but I can also understand to some ex extent how uh, top-level riders might be slightly worried that they might think, uh-oh, next time I'm going to ride into the arena, the judge is going to remember that I've said something that perhaps I shouldn't have said and they might mark me down. And even though a judge might certainly not deliberately want to do that, and, and I keep repeating that, um, that they want to be fair and they want to judge well, because otherwise they wouldn't be judges, you know, if they didn't want to do a good job. But, it, it, you know, but we are influenced by our past experiences, and quite often that happens unconsciously. And, and that's one of the things that I think... Um, again, where I agree with Catherine, that we have to be open and that we have to face the fact that we are people and, and people do act unconsciously. Sometimes we don't think about things. And especially in the heat of the moment at a big show or even at the smaller show, we might make decisions that afterwards, you know, uh, at another time of day, we might think, ah, oh, should I have done it like this? So this is really where openness and professionalism comes in. Catherine. Yeah, if I could add to that, and to be fair, I, I often come away from a test and look at my score sheets and think, I think, what went on there? And looking at one score from one judge or something and, and thinking that it was unfair and that, it was, that I really had ridden better in that moment and should have gotten a higher score. But when I, as a, as a human being, am truly fair, I have often skimmed through with a better note than what I actually thought I deserved. So I think that the riders need to keep that in mind also. And what I think is extremely important is that the riders that do work their way to the top of the sport, we have to continue to be honest with each other and with ourselves. And that means if you're getting points that you know you shouldn't be getting, it doesn't mean you have to give them back, but it does mean that that also requires examination that the judges sometimes are overscoring rides that they shouldn't be overscoring, and they're underscoring other rides that would deserve more points. So the riders also have to accept that we have days where we're given more than we should, uh, more points than we should. And, and we need to look at it not that it's always the judges in error, but our approach to the subject is what defines us as having integrity or not. Do you want to expand on that, Catherine, our approach to the subject? Well, what I mean is we as riders have to continue to be fair, and that means that if there's a rider at the top, who knows that he is being overscored or she is being overscored. For me, it's, it's not very brave to sit back on your heels and say, hey, I'm at the top of the sport. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I'm going to say stop complaining about the judging. I like the system the way it is. Because if you're benefiting from a system that is not 
professional enough, that is not objective enough, then for me, that's not, you're not coming from a point of integrity. In other words, you're, you're enjoying a system that is not good enough. And you should be honest enough to say, okay, we do need to make changes. Most, I would say 95, maybe 98% of the riders that I know agree that we need to make changes in the way we are being judged. But there are one or two percent who continue to say publicly that the system is just fine, leave it alone. Inga, how does the sport address that? Well, I think what we've seen um, in the past couple of years is very positive. Um, I, I, I also hasten to add that change does take time because I think we're dealing with a very traditional sport, um, especially if you, co- if you compare it perhaps to, 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 to other sports um, that have taken on board perhaps uh, science a little bit more easily or that you know aren't rooted as much in traditionalism as, as we are. Um, but I still think that especially if you if you look at the recent changes that have been implemented, uh, for example, the supervisory panel, for example, the introduction of the half marks, um, including seven judges. And at the end of the day, I, I'm, to be honest, I'm not totally sure whether I agree with all of those changes, but I do think it, it what what it stands for is an openness to to listen to the views. Um, I also think that we cannot expect everything to change overnight. But I also agree that we need to try and t- get everybody on board so that everybody is open for change. Because w- once again, uh, again, I, I agree with Catherine that there are uh, some people still that sort of say, no, 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 it's fine what we're doing and we all know what we're doing and, and it's good the way it is. Uh, and, and those voices you do, do hear uh, often enough still, and, and those are the people that, that quite often are in a position to make decisions, and they are perhaps holding back some of the changes that might be necessary. But having said that, what personally what I found very pleasant is last year in 2010 when we had this panel discussion on uh, that the judging system needed to change, and I gave my very short presentation on on some of the human biases that do occur. And at the time, I was met with, well, quite a bit of disbelief, really. And a year on, everybody's just taken it on. And that's really super um, in the sense that now people are very open and they say, well, actually, you know, we are probably biased and let's do something about it. And the minute you start doing that, you have a much better chance of actually in the, in the case of biases then, uh, of, of working against those and not being influenced so much by them. Well, disbelief or denial, of course. And yeah. I'm sure that when a judge is in that position and confronted, it's only human nature that they would get, as we say in cricketed terms, get on the back foot and become defensive. Mm-hmm. And there are judges, just like any humans, that, that won't accept the need for change and won't accept criticism. Now, no matter how constructive that criticism is presented. So we're dealing with these unconscious biases. We're dealing with judges or individuals who don't feel that they are, uh, they should be reproached on, on any of their scoring. And that, that, that's a, that's a human condition, isn't it? Yes, I, I would I would say so, and and we find that in in all walks of life, uh, people that that are quite set in their ways, and you know, and, and we could be all psychologists now and start analysing why that is, but I don't think we'll have time for all of that. But essentially, you know, you you meet that everywhere, um, and and as you say, I think I think the only solution is to be as positive and as constructive as possible, and just sort of chip away at the old block really um, to try and and. Uh, and get things and people to change. Well, I'm going to throw something else in there, Catherine, because you'll be so aware of this, particularly being in the heart of the European scene. And and, and that is the the unconscious biases, the, 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 the star um, stigma, the stigma around stars, um, the, the, precon- the preconditioning, if you will, of judges and the expectations of certain riders. There's, there's the politics as well, and y- I'm sure you've got your finger on that pulse. 
Well, star star quality is is politics. I mean, that is one of the things that we are hoping to address in the future with judging is that um, a star doesn't just get one of the people, one of the, let's say one of the top ten doesn't just get to ride down the center line and cruise on their past performances. We would hope that they continue to improve and earn their points every time they ride down the center line. But I want to I wanted to jump back just for a second about what what Inga was discussing in her last. Um, point here and that's that these hidden influences these hidden biases in the judging of the sport there was a great denial about it in 2010 and and I would really like to commend Katrina Wust and and Vim Ernest for the presentation that they gave at the Global Dressage Forum last October because they both basically came out and said yes we accept it there are hidden influences in the sport there are hidden biases and they must be just um, addressed which I think opened up the entire community and there was a big there was a collective sigh of relief because that was such a a turnaround from the year before and the denial that had been there the year before was now being openly um, done away with by two of our very highest ranked judges in the world. Well that's very encouraging because that elephant in the room at sooner or later had to be confronted didn't it? Absolutely, and I commend both of them for having the courage to stand up and say it out loud in, in, in front of a public audience, and I, I think it was a really productive discussion that followed. Well, our listeners may be thinking, well, that's all very well and good. That's at international level. That's at Grand Prix level we're mainly talking about here with the points you make, you're making. But that does filter down to the lower levels, doesn't it, Inga? Yes, um, it absolutely does. Because, of course, we are talking now about the top because the top's in the limelight. That's where not all of the money, but quite a lot of the money is. Um, But at the end of the day, and I do see that actually as a major problem. At the end of the day, it's only through fairness at, or shall I say, accuracy at grassroots level is that we keep people in the sport. And I think we all know that, uh, that equestrian sport isn't, isn't a safe sport. You know, we hear those issues time and again and, and, you know, and we face our fair share of problems that doesn't make the sport uh, more popular by any stretch of the imagination. So I think trying to keep the young people, the young people, trying to keep anybody on board, getting them to work their way through the grassroots levels is really important. And if they feel that they're only being judged, and I'm now being extremely blunt, but by the size of their wallet then you have a problem. So, you know, again, we've just spoken about what actually in in sporting terminology is called reputation bias, so this star bias. But you also get that at the lower lower levels and perhaps a reputation in the local scene. You know, a a rider comes in and perhaps they're not Grand Prix, but, you know, but they're well known in their area. And again, as Catherine, as you said, you know, they only have to ride down the center line and they'll get the score. Or, you know, it's it's a pedigree. The, the, the judge looks at the at, at the horse and knows what kind of breeding, breeding it is. And it goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what the father did of the horse then. Um, so, so the horse will get the points. And I think that's a real big issue. So I think even at the lower levels, um, we also need to make sure that judges are aware of that they're influenced unconsciously with, by these hidden biases. Well, of course, there's the other scenario, isn't there? The cocktail party the night before. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. And you're, you're mingling with people. Maybe you haven't been to that area before. Maybe you don't know the local riders, but you're going to be influenced by the, the movers and the shakers at that cocktail party before you get in the dressage box, aren't you? And you're going to think, well, yep. they did say such and such a breeding, such and such a combination, such and such a a horse or rider or how they're related. There's all those influences, Catherine. You must see that all the time. Because, of course, you're such a socialite in Germany. I'm hardly a socialite, but (laughs) I do see it all the time. And I think, okay, and again, I'm speaking from a perspective right now from the top level of the sport because you don't always find the cocktail party at your local schooling show. But at the higher level of the sport, there is the cocktail party, there is the VIP lounge, there is the VIP section where the riders are allowed, the coaches, the trainers, um, the chef de keeps, and the judges. And of course, everybody knows in the sport that it's the job of the coaches and the chef de keep to present their team and their team riders in the best possible light, uh, or at an individual competition to push one ahead of the others, or try to get the more, more points out of things. So I think... While I think it's very good to have an exchange between riders, coaches, chef to keeps, and trainers, 
and judges. I don't think that that's really an appropriate forum. I don't think that a horror show is an appropriate forum for that because I think it becomes one of the hidden influences. For instance, I can give you a really good example here. Uh, a trainer could go to a judge and say, um, how do you feel about Susie's ride? I haven't been able to watch her for the last couple of horse shows. Is she improving? And if the judge says, oh, yes, well, absolutely, I've been very well impressed by her, the trainer can then ask, well, what are her strong points? At which point the, the judge will say, oh, well, her pirouettes have definitely got much better. But if the trainer says, what are her weak points? And they start to c discussing that the horse is behind the vertical a lot. Then that may be something that the judge begins looking for in the next test. So I think the power of suggestion, despite the fact that many judges, even the very top and best judges, will deny that they can be influenced by a conversation before the test, I know myself as a human being, and I think I would be slightly influenced. It's going to go into your psyche, isn't it, Inga? Whichever way you look at it and wherever you've, you're conscious of the things that, that Catherine just mentioned, you may be made aware of these. And you may listen to this show and go away thinking, yeah, I should be aware of them. But then your psyche kicks in, your, your subconsciousness, doesn't it? Absolutely. And let's also not forget that a lot of these judges, no matter what, what show they're at, um, also sit in their judge's box for quite a long time. Um, hours at a time perhaps which also means and and you know they're expected to to be fully concentrated for the entire test now that is actually you know that's without without a doubt actually very 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 difficult to be concentrated the entire time what you then also have you have the pressure of a show because you know as, as a sports psychologist you know I talk to a lot of athletes about competition anxiety but at the end of the day for a judge that's also quite stressful to be there because they know as well as as anybody that that riders have put in a lot of time a lot of effort a lot of money uh, to perform so the judge also wants to perform so it's there is also a sort of performance anxiety and again depends on the individual how, how strongly that will affect them but then um, they also have limited amounts of time you know uh, perhaps an, an exercise is over a movement is over in a, a couple of seconds depends a bit on what it is you know for example when you look at tempi changes you might just you know you might have just looked at your score sheet and there you go the riders just made a mistake so what I, and, and you know and you've missed it. So so what that means is that you might be thinking, oh dear, have I now seen everything that I have to see, ha, that I needed to see? I am not certain. So what do I do? Do I give it a six? Do I give it a seven? Do I give it a seven or do I give it an eight? And then the mind flashes back to the conversation they've had the day before, or to a press release that they read in the newspaper or whatever. And then the seven might become a seven and a half or the seven and a half might become an eight. Quite simply, and this is what I refer to as shortcuts, when there's an awful lot of information to be taken in in a short amount of time, what we do, because we're not computers, we revert to shortcuts. And if push comes to shove, if you have a shortcut at the, at the, at the front of your head, really, because you've just spoken about it um, the, the evening before, that's what you're going to revert to, and that's then where the bias comes in. Well, accuracy and fairness, of course, and then judges giving equal scores or being close to each other. Do you want to expand on that a bit, Inga? Because I'm sure all our listeners who compete are looking at their score sheets and thinking, well, how come that was all the way up there and the other one was all the way down here? <laughs> Well, this is an interesting aspect, and I know that that people have been and um, been getting quite wound up about that, and 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 I've been thinking about this uh, for quite a long time, and I've I've studied a little bit of the literature also of of other sports where they've uh, investigated visual search behaviour. Um, again, one of my recent studies looked into that, um, but what what other sports have also found and i think there's it's it's quite useful to also compare it to what we know in in other sporting disciplines is that the position from which a judge or a referee because quite a lot of studies are done in football for example is very important for making decisions now we always say that we expect our judges at c and our judges at b and e uh, and and 
and the judges at the quarter markers to all um, be as close to each other as possible. However, and I think this is a very important point, and I think we need to look quite seriously as whether that is really what we want. If you look at Piaf from the front, so from the position of the judge at C, will some of the time, perhaps not all of the time, but some of the time, look quite different to what the judge at B or the judge at E will look at. So it may well be possible that the judge at C looks at it and goes, well, it's very straight or, you know, whatever. Well, the judge at B or at E, they might be looking at something completely different and therefore might be giving it a slightly different score. That doesn't necessarily mean that that is inaccurate when the scoring diverges. But, and here again, I, I, I stress this, we need to make sure that we know what we're talking about. Because at the moment, and this is what I see, is because our sport is so based on tradition, a lot of the time we think we found the answer, but without really having investigated in great detail. And I think that's something that we really need to do now. And I think the, the atmosphere is, is, is right for that because people are much more open. And the judges are responding to it, if I may. Yeah. And I, I think, again, this has been a very positive development in the sport. If you go to the FBI website and look under dressage, I think it's under dressage rules, you'll find that there are a whole series of new directives written um, by our, our head judge, um, Gislan Porag, who is basically defining each individual movement in the Grand Prix and telling the judges what to look for and what should be rewarded and what should, should be penalized in each movement. So we are redefining how the judges look at each individual movement and just not accepting the traditional idea of what it should be. And I, I do think that it's accuracy is, accuracy is necessary in the judging of the sport. I don't think that you can always expect scores to be the same, but I do have to say that one of my greatest frustrations as a, as a competitor is a huge difference in my scores, especially if it's between B and E, for instance. You would expect the judges at, on the long sides of the arena to see the test pretty much the same. And if a judge is sitting um, on the short side, you would not expect such a great divergence in scores as you would from the short side to the long side. So every now and then I've had some scores that were literally inexplicable in their divergence. And and if uh, Chris, if I if I may respond to Catherine there, um, I I couldn't agree more because of what you what you've just what you've just said, indeed you you would expect the judges at the long side uh, to be much closer together in the marking, um, while a discrepancy between judges short side and long side that might be more explicable, um, and I think this is something that we need to to look at in more in in greater detail, um, but they, indeed there seems to be. Uh, the trend towards greater definition so that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet, as they say. And, of course, everyone around the arena is a judge. Everyone in the stands yeah. is a judge. <laughs> yeah. and, and we'll have a, an opinion, and we'll have an opinion based on their perspective, but also their own biases. And that's, you know, it's a challenge, isn't it? To You can't keep everybody happy. Somehow you don't seem to be able to keep happy everyone happy. That. The, the, the symptom of politics bothers me, Catherine, because, you know, from a media point of view, we watch those influences and we watch the tests and we watch how scores are maybe not given where they should be given. Um, and it's almost as if the judges are afraid to go there simply because, well, to be politically correct, so-and-so who, you know, who is coming in afterwards, is go, we would expect them to do a better test because they are who they are, the star quality thing again. That's a difficult one, isn't it? Yes, it is. But actually, I'm going to respond to that in a way that will surprise you. I, I'm not only a competitor at top shows, but I'm, I'm also an observer and spec, a spectator often. And I can tell you that probably 90% of the time I have agreed, agreed with the judges' placings at major championships and, and major horse shows, both in, in the United States and here in Europe, from my own observation. Um, the problem, for me, the problem with the sport is we all believe that political bias, which would which basically, I mean, what is political bias? That, that includes all hidden influences, whether it's a conversation with the judge or a sponsor that's putting a lot of money behind a rider um, who has a conversation with the judge. Or the, the thing is, 
most of the judges that I know try really hard not to be influenced by this. And I do think they do a very professional job. The problem is if they make a mistake or they make an error or they look down at the wrong moment or they disagree with the judge sitting across the arena from them and, and go with their own score, that score, because it diverges from the others, looks like, gives you the perception that it's a political decision. And what I have always argued about in this sport is that we need to remove the perception of political bias in order to make the sport a fair place. Whether it truly exists or not, the perception of bias needs to be removed. Inga. Couldn't agree more. Um, Catherine, while, while, you were, while you were talking, I was, I was sort of thinking also um, at, at the things that you say, you know, with, while, while I do think it's, it's quite a good idea to show open scoring um, at the major horse shows, I also see a, a problem with that in the sense that the public, for example, can react, which again causes another bias because the judges, um, unless they sit in, in soundproof uh, judging boxes, um, will also hear and they can see the reaction of, 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 of the public, which might again sway them to, to judge differently. Um, and, but it, what, I, what I also see is, is because sometimes those judges that might dare to give a different score because they feel that that is right might be, if you like, forced into submission because they're, af they're afraid um, to, to, to really show their true colours. So in that sense, I, I agree that we need to try and get rid of this political bias, as you call it. Um, the, the only thing is that I, I still wonder a little bit how we're going to do that. Apart there are from but there are some solutions. We've discussed this at length in the International Dressage Riders Club. Um, and I, I actually would like to add at this point, one of the points I made near the beginning, that the riders need to be very open and not worry about having these kinds of discussions. If we had not started these discussions in the club about the judging, and if we had not all stuck together and stood up and said something, the really positive changes that we've seen in the last couple of years, the transparency, the, the addition of the half scores, uh, discussion of, of getting rid of running scores for judges to see, none of these things, would have, we would have just kept going like we were. It would have been status quo. So I, I really do disagree with the riders who say everything is fine, don't talk about it. That may be their method of you know, not getting a backlash from the judges, but it doesn't help the sport in the long run. We need to really concentrate on that. And as far as the judges seeing the scores and reacting to that, that was also a topic of discussion at the Global Dressage Forum, especially in the Riders Club. We strongly feel that the running score should not be visible to the judges. Yep. Because if, if you happen to be there as a spectator and you take the time to watch a judge, pick out one judge who you notice looking at the scoreboard occasionally, if you watch that one judge for the whole test and not their ride, you'll often see the judge checking himself on the scoreboard. And this doesn't happen with all of them. I would say our best judges concentrate on what they're doing, not on the score that's running above them. But the problem is that running score is highly influential. Yep. If I'm a judge and I'm giving mostly sixes and I look up and see that the score is, is high 60s, I realize I'm not high enough and I'm going to start giving more. And if I'm a judge who's giving sevens and eights and I look up and I see that the score is only at 65%, I realize I'm giving too much. So, and I do think it's a human desire to be right, to not be wrong. And therefore, if you look up and your scores are not matching what's going on in, in what you've been giving, you might for a moment say, oh, oh crap, I'm wrong. <laughs> And try to change that. Well, you don't want to be the odd one out, do you, Inga? You don't want to be the odd one out. And that, that running score must not be visible to the judges. We, we all agree on that. Even the judges agree on that. Is this being addressed by the FAI, Catherine? There is a, there's a rule. I don't, I, I'll have to look it up. I don't know exactly where it is, but it is recommended to the uh, horse show organizers, the dressage horse show organizers, that the running score is not visible. It may even be a fast rule. I'll, I'll have to look it up. But the recommendation is definitely there, that the running score is not visible. And, you know, that there's other ways to do it. We've discussed this before, to put the, the scoreboards behind the judges' boxes so that they're visible only to the spectators. 
which I think makes the sport very interesting for everyone. And it is it, it does speak to transparency and openness. It's a very good educational tool. And I think that showing the scores behind the judges is a great idea, but I don't think the judges should be able to see the score. But the showing of the scores behind the judges is only a great idea if people accept the fact that there will be a, di a divergence in opinion and that some of the scores will be different. And that is seen as a springboard for discussion, not criticism. Well, your final word from, from you, Inga, um, we need to wrap this up, but this is such an interesting uh, topic. To, there are so many aspects to it. Uh, what would be your final remarks? And also considering anyone that might think, well, one day I want to be a dressage judge. Well, what would be my final remark? I think, I think one of the most important things is, is to just be very... Well, unconscious bias or hidden biases are very difficult to combat by sheer willpower, but it does help. Trying to be aware of the things that might influence you and being open-minded about the kind of things that do exist. For example, uh, Catherine, what you were referring to is actually called the, um, the confirmation uh, bias in the sense that we want to conform with our peers. It's, it's a natural, it's a human condition, you know. We, we don't really like being the odd one out, indeed. And that is something that, that we know. So, but if you're aware of that... Um, you, you need to keep checking, okay, am I doing this because I think this is right or am I doing this because others think this is right? So, you know, so a lot of reflection, a lot of reflective skills is important for being a judge as much as, Catherine, as you said yourself, being a competitor because otherwise you're never going to reach the top. I, I do think that it is part also of the sport um, because I think dressage is partly so beautiful because it is about the horse rider interaction, the horse human interaction, um, but also because it is judged by human beings. You know, at the end of the day, we could get rid of all human judges and get some clever computer program to do it. But I think that would take away some of the art form and, and dressage riding is an art as, as well as a sport. So for those people that say, I want to get involved, I'd say absolutely go ahead, but try and be open about what you see, listen to people, but most importantly, try and make up your own mind and be as reflective about yourself as you possibly can. Good advice, Inga. On that note, we're going to wrap it up. I want to thank you so much indeed, Inga Wolfram, for joining us and giving us an insight into the psychology of dressage judging. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, it's a tough topic. I, I hope we'll, we'll, we'll come back around to this, Catherine, in the future. I'm sure that we will, Chris. Well, before we go this week, um, we're going to hear from the U.S. Dressage Federation and their monthly update. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Chris. How are you? Good, thank you. And a happy new year to you and everybody at USDF. Well, thank you, and Happy New Year to you. Well, we're kicking off a very important uh, year, of course, with the Olympics ahead of us, but there's all kinds of business going on with the USDF. It doesn't matter what the year is, doesn't it? No, we, we seem to be ongoing, and uh, we, too, are looking forward to a very busy and productive year. So what do you have for us this month? Well, today we're going to be talking with Sarah Jorgensen, who is the founder of Perfect World Dressage, and Christina Firth, who's the senior competitions coordinator here in the USDF office. Um, Sarah and Christina, welcome to the program today. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Nice to be here. Um, Sarah, tell us about Perfect World Dressage, and, and um, we have created a new partnership with USDF, and tell us about how that partnership was developed. Sure. Well, Perfect World Dressage is a new concept in dressage education. We allow people to videotape themselves at home writing dressage tests and then upload it to our website um, where we have USEF, uh, S, and large art judges who judge the tests. Um, and so this kind of um, opens up a new world for some people who maybe aren't ready to show or, or need a little bit of help getting into the show ring. The USDF Perfect World Dressage Challenge Program is a new collaboration between um, Perfect World and USDF that allows people to get recognition for their videotaped tests through USDF. So it's kind that of an exciting. exciting. Yeah, 
It really does. I think it's it's a neat way for um, people to kind of test the waters with uh, showing or maybe to show a, a young horse or things like that and, and just see see where, where they can go with things. And, Sarah, all current USDF members are eligible for a complimentary gold membership. Is that correct? That is correct. So we have set up um, a, a new uh, collaboration where members of USDF can um, become gold members of Perfect World Dressage. And the gold membership is the, the top membership on the website. It enables people to um, have a profile page where they can upload 10 videos, 100 pictures, um, participate in the, the classified ads, and also then participate in the Dressage Challenge program. So I think it's a really great new member benefit. That's exciting. Um, Christina, um, as Sarah had mentioned, um, we have this new recognition program that's been developed between USDF and Perfect World Dressage. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that program is going to work? Well, the purpose of the program is to learn as you earn recognition for your achievement at uh, levels of introductory through second level. To be eligible, the rider must be a USDS member, um, and there are no requirements for the horse or the owner. Uh, the scores may be earned on one or more horses, um, and the rider must earn at least four scores at 58% or higher at any test of the level. The scores must be from four different rides and they must be scored from four different judges. So, that's so some of the, the, the idea will be that they'll videotape their ride and then have it submitted and scored through Perfect World Dressage, correct? Correct, yes. And then to earn a, a recognition certificate at um, any of the levels from introductory to second, they must have a minimum of four scores uh, uh, judged at 58% or higher. And can a rider earn a recognition certificate more than once? They may earn a recognition certificate at each of the various levels. So, yes, they could earn more than one certificate at a different level. Okay. Um, when do you, when is it anticipated that this program will be um, implemented? We are planning to implement this program in this um, coming 2012 competition year. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, well, Sarah, what other types of memberships are available on Perfect World Dressage? We talked a little bit about the gold membership. Are there any other levels of membership? There is. There's a, a free membership um, that anyone can join um, and and start submitting videos if they like. Um, the the free membership doesn't allow you to um, post your videos for other people to see or post your pictures. Um, and then there's a silver membership, which is kind of halfway between the gold and the free and allows um, a few video uploads and picture uploads. Um, the gold membership is only $15 a year, so it's really quite economical and, and um, enables you to kind of peruse through the website and, and take advantage of everything. And there's an instructional component as part of that as well, where they can upload a, a, a ride and they can have an instructor evaluate yeah. it from an instructional standpoint. Yes, we're really excited about that. So if you don't want to ride a test or if you're looking for help on maybe a specific thing, such as a you know, walk track transition, um, you can film up to five minutes of video of whatever you like and then you can upload that video along with um, comments and questions for the judge that um, or the trainer that will view it, and then they um, come back with uh, their insights and some recommendations on exercises and things like that to really work on that problem. And I think it's nice. There are some people that don't have access to trainers because of where they live, or maybe they're just looking for a new set of eyes on a problem, which sometimes that can make all the difference in the world just having, you know, someone new look at something and just clicks for you. So I, I think it's a great thing for people to try, too. Yeah, I think it will give a lot of people who don't have access, as you said, to um, some instruction, the opportunity to get a second set of eyes on their work and, mm -hmm. and what's going on with their writing. 
Exactly. Well, thank you, Sarah and Christina, for joining thank us you. today. And for more thank information you. about Perfect World Dressage and the new recognition program, you can visit their website at www.perfectworlddressage.com. And you can also visit the USDF website at www.usdf.org for information on this recognition program and the member benefits that Perfect World Dressage will be providing for our USDF members. Thank you again, Sarah and Christina, and back to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Catherine. Well, we'll catch up with you next month for more news from the U.S. Dressage Federation. I look forward to it. Well, Catherine, uh, before we go, um, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this to you before. You know, I, I think I probably did when you've been on the show before. We're really into apps here at the Horse Radio Network. That is smartphone apps, whether it be for BlackBerry, or iPhone, Android. And we're always looking at the new ones out there because you can listen to the shows using your iPhone app. Hallway Feeds uh, has an app for, for our shows and uh, so does Instacast. I p- personally like Instacast because it automatically downloads the latest episodes when you open the app. But there's one I want to talk about this week, Catherine, which I, I, I know that you're not going to be really into this anymore, but I think there might be some listeners that are. And it's called Horse Hotties. Have you heard about it? I, I have heard about it, but I haven't had a chance to check it out for myself. Because, um, you know, you wouldn't be checking it out in the same way anymore. I mean, just as, as general interest. Now, it, uh, don't you just love the title? Yes, I do, actually. <laughs> well, well, basically. I have a to ask, actually. <laughs> basically, it is a location-based equestrian social networking app. So you could meet your horse hottie through an iPhone app. I mean, how easy could that get, Catherine? How easy could it be? That's pretty easy. What what exactly <laughs> what exactly is your horse haughty? Because I can't imagine my horse picking up the other smartphone to respond to me. So it must be someone in my social group. I'm assuming it it is. It's connecting a global equestrian community is is how they describe it. And you can download this to your iPhone. I'm not sure if it's available uh, on Android or BlackBerry, but it's certainly available on all the Mac products, the iPhone, the iPod Touch, and the iPad. And it's a fun online dating website for what they call a question. And I like this part, rural party people. Now, what, what, are you one of those that set, the rural party people? I don't believe I am. <laughs> I can't be sure of that answer, but I don't believe I am. <laughs> well, this is obviously a great way to meet you know, other people that are single. And I, I think it's more than just looking for friends. You can, you can just look for friends in the horse world. But also, they're encouraging you to find your horsey hottie. Um, so, okay, so this is basically a dating hotline is what we're talking about. It's here. a dating app, yeah. That's why I was thinking... Dating you know, I, hey, I get it. I get it now. I knew there had to be some kind of inside rub there. Interesting. Okay. So online dating website for, uh, uh, you know, if you are out there as a single and you want to make friends or you want to uh, be dating. As, as a Catherine, you're, you know, you're, you've passed that point. And, and I would like to, to think that I'm past that point. But, you know, am I past that point, Catherine? Am, am, I, too, am, am I way past the horsey hottie stage? What do you think? No, absolutely not, Chris. That, I think you should be the first to use that application. I'm only past it because I'm a married woman now. Of course. You have to be very careful what you say, too, don't you? I mean, That's your, right. Your husband could be listening and wondering, why is she even interested in this? <laughs> Actually, I'm not. But what does interest me, interest me is the fact that Apple is taking over the world. Do you realize that? Oh, it is. It is. And now you're an iPhone user, aren't you? Yes, I am. And I'm proud of it. But I, you know, when I, when I send stuff up to that iCloud, I ask myself, hmm, <laughs> it's like a whole, yes. whole other dimension that exists now. And I, I have a, a whole bunch of friends who are on iPhone and my husband's on iPhone. We don't really need an app to communicate because we've got our iPhones. We do free iMessaging now. Um, we can do FaceTime. It's part of the, part of the reason my husband and I managed to have such a great relationship living in two different countries is that we can FaceTime all the time, which is really nice. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, that really just changes the whole dimension, doesn't it, of long distance relationship? Yes, it does. Absolutely. And you know what they say about a long distance relationship? It's only a test of how far the lover will travel. That's true. Do you, do you like that? <laughs> I do like that. 
In fact, right after Christmas, I spontaneously got on a plane and flew home to, to New Jersey to be with my husband for New Year's Eve, which was really nice. Oh, um, and, he, and he wasn't expecting you? Well, I had to tell him 24, 24 hours before I arrived, and then he was expecting me. But he, actually, if you want to hear a funny story, because I, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a very well-known practical joker. I love to play practical jokes. I can't on- believe it. No, and I have to tell you, right after you tell me this story, I'm going to tell you why I didn't believe that, but go ahead. <laughs> so I arrived at Newark Airport wearing a very beautiful blonde wig. <laughs> and I, my husband is an extremely observant man. He knows how I walk. He knows my body language. So I also had to change the way I walked. And I wore a pair of shoes that he wouldn't recognize. And I stacked my luggage in such a way that he wouldn't be able to tell it was mine. And I wore a coat that he didn't know. And I strutted right past him, out the door with my luggage, turned around outside and came back into the terminal and stood next to him, texting him saying, where are you? I can't find you. <laughs> And he said, I'm standing, he texts back, I'm standing right next to Starbucks. And I said, so am I. Why can't I see you? <laughs> and I was standing right next to him the whole time. And when I, I knew that if I looked him in the eye, he would know it was me. And then I did finally turn around and look him in the eye. And he, was, he was so mad because I got him. <laughs> I'm going to be sure not to call you on April Fool's Day. Oh, don't, oh, no, don't. Don't do that. <laughs> there are many people in this world who will give you the advice not to talk to me on April Fool's Well, day. actually, a lot of people say that about me. They, should, they, you know, they literally avoid me on April 1st. Um, so, yeah, we both have a reputation for that being terrible teasers. Yeah. The reason why I was, I was going to say I hardly believe that you're a practical joker because a lot of people don't think that you have a sense of humor, Catherine Haddad. <laughs> Is that because I've lived in Germany so long? <laughs> no, but you remember last year we did this uh, equestrian vacation, uh, yes. the, the, the dream vacation. Yes. And you were the first one on that series. And right. you were so serious about you. were. Go- we got into the, the real no-nos on the Horse Radio Network is religion and politics. And you went straight there. You yes. went straight there with where you, who and where you were going to go, uh, you know, where, how you wanted to spend your dream vacation. And, you know, I heard people saying, gosh, you're serious. Gosh, you know, she doesn't know how to take a vacation. So I'm, <laughs> I'm really glad that they understand that there really is a very funny side to Catherine Haddad. She, she is a practical joker. Okay, but now remember, I did talk, I did start that conversation with you about the vacation by saying that every day is a holiday for me, and that is true. That is true. I play practical jokes on people all the time. We're always laughing in my stable. Um, one day, when we have enough time, I'll tell you about about the cat trick that I pulled. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this has to uh, be for our next episode. The next time you come on the show, Catherine, save okay, up your you cat story. That one. You have to hear that one. I definitely have to hear that one. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you've got a few more stories that you can tell us uh, when you come on again. If, if, oh, absolutely. If you're, if you're this practical joker. So I, I think uh, our audience is going to be relieved to know that there is a wicked, wicked sense of humor to Catherine had had. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, Catherine, that just about wraps it up for us this week. Uh, we're going to get out of here, but not without reminding everybody to check out our show notes at dressageradio.com and uh, join us over on Facebook, as I'm sure many of you will have your thoughts thoughts on the topics that we discussed today as part of our uh, assessment of dressage judging and uh, as always you can uh, listen to us on iphone apps and uh, download the episode on itunes it's a free subscription so be sure to join us there and listen to all the other shows here on the horse radio network well Catherine, what are you going to be doing then in the next few weeks um if you if you're not going to have uh, some decent snow skiing and it's raining in uh, germany just riding 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 Yes, basically, yeah, which I'm actually looking forward to. I I took a little bit of time off last fall. Um, I needed a a short break and to do some recuperation, and I'm back in action now, and Winyamaro is gearing up for the winter season. I think we still have a couple World Cup qualifiers ahead of us, and um, then we'll be looking toward qualifying for the U.S. selection trials. Wonderful. So a very big year for you. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, keeping me company again. It's always great to have you on. You're welcome, Chris. And that's it for us. So I will be back, of course, at the same time, same place next week. So until then, thank you all for listening.